So good morning, everyone. So we start today, today's lecture. And what I'd like to do first is to recap uh, one strong idea that uh, both Anna and I try to uh, give you <laughs> about this uh, resonant dipole-dipole interaction. And uh, I will, because I realized through the question that I had after the lecture, that I have not discussed properly this experiment, which is the last slide I showed you yesterday. And actually, this experiment contains essentially everything. I mean, if you have understood that, you, you have understood a lot about this resonant dipole interaction. So you remember that we consider yesterday in a kind of toy, mod toy model two atoms, A and B, with ground and excited states, and with an energy different between them, which was omega naught. There is no light in the problem. I do not have, if the atoms is prepared in G <laughs> or in E, there is no dipole. Okay, that's very important to consider that. And yet, those two atoms, they cannot exist in a uh, philosophical vacuum, in the sense in the vacuum with nothing. They are necessarily coupled to the vacuum field, which means that you always have to write <coughs> in this the Hamiltonian of the first atom, the Hamiltonian of the second atom, and the vacuum fields. So these vacuum fields can be written so in a simplified way in this way. But also the coupling of these vacuum modes to the dipoles. dA dot A plus A dagger K times an amplitude, and the same thing with B. Okay? So this is the full Hamiltonian. So when you take two atoms, everyone sh uh, think that I only have H A and H B. That's wrong. You cannot have any uh, two atoms without the vacuum. The vacuum is always present, the electromagnetic field. Now, through a procedure which is not obvious, I mean, that was the full lecture uh, of uh, Anna uh, yesterday, we can eliminate the field. Okay? And when you eliminate the field, you find at the end of the day that you can reduce the total uh, Hamiltonian of the universe, at least for those two atoms, in an Hamiltonian which only depends on the atomic variables. Okay, so you've got HA plus HB plus something which actually is what I call VDD, but in the language of Anna it was the green function times some terms, but it's the same thing. Operator sigma plus sigma minus, sigma minus sigma plus. This operator being the rising, so this is A and B, or lowering operator. I do insist there is no light, there is no induced dipole, no nothing. Okay? And still, this Hamiltonian features this interaction part. So in a sense, when I wrote the Coulomb field D1, D2 over R cube yesterday, it's a really pedestrian approach to actually say that I have removed the electromagnetic vacuum. Okay? So when you write, and that's the thing you've learned uh, when you were kids about this D1, D2 over R cube, this is just an elegant way to remove the field, but the field is here. Okay, the real Hamiltonian is this in the near field. This VDD, I remind you, had an expression which was rather complicated, but at the end of the day, this is dEG square over R cube times this uh, 1 over kR cube minus I over kR square plus other terms times E to the I kR, which in the near field gives you exactly the Coulomb field. Okay? But you see that the underlying procedure is I needed to get rid of the field. Okay, so once again, the thing that you should not think about is two atoms separated uh, by a given distance in a vacuum with nothing. <laughs> the vacuum is always present. This is the electromagnetic field. And when you trace out, you find the Coulomb law, you find the dipole-dipole interaction, and so on. Okay? So now you have this Hamiltonian, which only includes <coughs> variables, atomic variables. And I still have no light, no excitation, no induced dipole, no nothing. I just have an Hamiltonian for which I can find the eigenenergies. <coughs> and that's what we've done for the toy model. Essentially, we add this as a function of the distance. Eg plus or minus GE, EE, and GG. Okay? So if you are in the near field here, this is the case where the interaction is essentially DEG square over R cube. And this is the near field. And what I, when I write that, I actually mean that I am in the regime where KR 
is much smaller <coughs> than one. Okay, so the distance between the two atoms is much smaller than the wavelength, the radius wavelength. And in this case, you can apply your electrostatic. If you are in the, let's say, uh, me intermediate field, actually, if you do the thing properly, you add this term with the oscillatory behavior that I showed you yesterday. Okay? Right, so now let's look at this experiment. So now comes the light. Okay, I want to reveal this spectrum. How do I do? I send a light field. So I prepare the two molecules in state G. I turn on a laser with a frequency omega, and I scan omega through the resonance. So those two peaks that you see, and once again, you forget this one, which correspond to actually a two-photon excitation to the excited state. So let's neglect this one. It's not important. The only thing I want to emphasize is the presence of those two peaks. Those two peaks are separated by the difference in energy, which if you remember correctly yesterday's lecture, are just the real part of VDD. Now, if we are in the intermediate field on top of that, we need to care about spontaneous emission from this state. This is the subradiant and subradiant, superradiant and subradiant state. One has a larger line width than individual atom, the other one has a, a smaller. Okay, so you will find two lines, one narrower than the other one, because you see the sub with respect to the superradiant uh, 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 state. Okay, so this is where the light is. And so now if I ask a question, what is the average value of the energy? <coughs> the average value of the interaction energy. I do need to have the light in. Okay, this is zero if the atoms are in the ground state, in the absence of light. But now, let's assume that I populate this state, for example. If I populate, so when you have light on, and I populate with, a with an excitation with a probability P plus the plus state, then the average value, so which is proportional to the intensity of the light, the average value of this dipole-dipole is now non-zero. It's actually VDD times the probability to have put the system in state plus. So where is the light? It's here. But the VDD doesn't need the light. It's just mediated by the vacuum. So that's where you have to be very careful. So when we talk about light-induced interaction, we always lie. Okay? The interaction is present even without the light. But you do reveal it by doing the spectroscopy or by exciting this state. That's clear? So I think, Anna, this is also your message, uh, uh, I guess. Uh, do you have anything to add? Or what? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So, but I think this kind of summarized the thing. So once again, the mistake is to think that two atoms can be in a real vacuum with nothing. It's completely wrong. You always need to include the electromagnetic field, but you can trace out through the procedure derived by Anna, the field in order to only have an Hamiltonian with atomic degrees of freedom, okay? So that's the first thing I wanted to say uh, today, just to come back to that, and so, now we come to uh, today's lecture. <coughs> so any questions so far? And I've been told that I'm too quick. I usually don't leave <laughs> uh, people uh, the time to ask questions. So no, no questions? OK. But once again, uh, the, the thing which is always important is do not mix the matrix element. Uh, let's say for the dipole, do not confuse this and DEG. DEG is never zero, but you can have an average dipole, which is zero, if psi is just E. Uh, do not get confused with those two things. All right, so <coughs> if there are no other questions, let's move to today's lecture. Uh, so lecture one uh, of yesterday was uh, about dipole-dipole interactions. And so today, we're going to uh, dive a bit more into uh, Rydberg physics, in particular when the atoms uh, interact with each other. And I will show you some experimental uh, consideration where you produce arrays of tweezers and some experiment where we measure the interaction energy between uh, atoms and uh, in particular reaching the, the case which is called the Rydberg blockade. And if I have the time, I will uh, move to some application in quantum information, otherwise I do that tomorrow. So this is uh, part of the slide I showed you yesterday. 
what we want to do <coughs> is to engineer a synthetic system where you can do many body physics. And I gave you a few applications, so why you would do that, so metrology is part of them, uh, quantum simulation, uh, quantum computation, and so on. So basically, this is the platform that we're going to discover a bit more in detail, but many of you are kind of familiar with that. So this is an ensemble of atoms. Each dot here corresponds to one atom, and those atoms are separated by a large distance, <coughs> typically five micrometers. <coughs> so five micrometers, this is too far for the atoms to be able to tunnel from one side to the other. So there is no tunneling like you what you would have in optical lattices. And second, if they are in the ground state, they do not interact, or at least the van der Waals interaction is way too small. So the S-wave interaction that Hugh has described to you is totally negligible on this system. Okay, so now you need something in order to do many body physics. You need to crank up the interactions. And that's where the Rydberg idea comes into play because now you can enhance considerably the strength of the interactions with scaling laws that we will describe and therefore have in this completely addressable system, so you can basically uh, talk or manipulate each atom and still you are able to make them interact. And so we will describe the two kinds of interaction that you can have with the Rydberg and basically building on what we studied yesterday, so van der Waals and resonance. Okay? So this is the outline which is extremely ambitious, so most likely I will cover the three first part. Okay? Doesn't really matter actually. Uh, I will give you a few uh, Ideas about Rydberg atoms, hopefully not overlapping too <coughs> much with uh, Jean-Michel. There will be a slight difference, but uh, Jean-Michel gave you already uh, the basic uh, important consideration about Rydberg. So here I will focus more about their interaction. Then I will spend a bit of time uh, describing uh, how you create the individual ensemble of, uh, ensembles of individual atoms. And I will show you experiment where we measure the interaction between Rydberg atoms, and that would be a nice introduction towards the physics of Rydberg blockade and how you can use it to do quantum information. And tomorrow we'll do mainly quantum simulation with those platforms. Okay, so let's start with the, uh, the properties of the Rydberg atoms. So for those of you who are interested in the references, so there are many around, there is a kind of a textbook which uh, is already kind of old and it's pretty thick and there are many more details that you actually don't want to know. So, uh, so if you want, uh, there are some more recent reviews uh, of the problem uh, that you can find in the literature. So. Okay, so let's first, uh, and I don't know whether Jean-Michel uh, talked to you about that, so let's uh, discuss a bit uh, about <coughs> history of Rydberg atoms. So you did not know. So. Uh, so the Rydberg atoms actually, they appear kind of the first time, obviously not in the name Rydberg atoms, uh, kind of at the end of Napoleon's era, uh, era sorry, uh, which uh, was in 1814, uh, from Joseph Fraunhofer, from the Fraunhofer diffraction. So what the guy said is that he observed dark lines in the spectrum of the sun. Okay? And actually he, he measured a kind of um, uh, infinite series of those dark lines. Okay, at the time no one really knew about uh, what that was, and so he took a few more years uh, until <coughs> Uh, Rydberg did some more spectroscopy and came out with what is called the Rydberg formula. So this is a copy of his uh, lab book. At the time it wasn't uh, on a keynote or whatever stuff you use. <laughs> it was uh, directly handwritten. And so you recognize in modern language this formula. So this is basically the formula that gives the wavelength of those dark lines that you have in the sun. Okay, and you recognize this idea that this is 1 over n square minus 1 over m square. It's fully empir empirical at this stage. But this is the idea that you've got an infinite series of states because n can vary from 1 to infinity. Okay. <coughs> and it's also the idea that you can have highly excited states in those atoms. Okay. At the time, this was essentially experimental and tweaking a bit the data. Okay, so we're going to, I mean, you know all this, obviously. Uh, so for the sake of this lecture, I'm going to focus mainly on alkali atom. Uh, this is mainly alkali atoms that have been studied uh, for Rydberg physics, at least for the interacting part. Uh, of course, there is a growing effort to include uh, many more atoms, especially from the second column, so I will not discuss that. Okay, so the nice property of an alkali atom is that essentially you can view them as hydrogen atoms because you have an outer electron and a single one, okay, in the closed shell. All right, so this is a bit more uh, in detail the energy spectrum of uh, Rydberg atoms, the rubidium, for example, so which is called the Grotrian diagram, for those of you who 
like uh, old style spectroscopy. So this is basically the classification in terms of the principal, quant the, sorry, the principal quantum number this way and the angular momentum. Of course, you have to understand that all of them also have a fine structure and so on, but uh, we don't care for the purpose of this uh, course. Okay, so the Rydberg state, as you s uh, well know, are states with very high uh, principal quantum number. So basically, how high? Well, it depends on your definition. But essentially, when you are above 10, you can say it's a Rydberg state. It doesn't mean that 9 is not and that 11 is. Of course, there is no sharp boundary. So classically, and it's always important to have classical pictures, uh, they correspond, those highly uh, excited states, to states where the electron is far from the nucleus. And in a minute, I will do the scaling, and this classical model is very useful to recover uh, the scaling very rapidly. If you've forgotten everything about your uh, hydrogen wave function from the Schrodinger equation. So, the two nice properties of these states that we will use are twofold. <coughs> the first one is the fact that when you are in one of these uh, Rydberg states, you stay there for quite some time. It's not super long, right? Those are not metastable states in the classical term where, for example, you would stay here for seconds, like in clock transition you've heard about. Uh, but still, it's much longer than on the usual optical transition. You've got like about 20 nanoseconds decay time for this one. If you are in a Rydberg state L equal 1, this would take 100 microseconds, so uh, much uh, 10,000 times longer. In such, okay, this is long but not that long, so the thing that is important is to compare it with another energy scale, and this is what we're going to do later. But so the second important thing, and that's going back to a question I had yesterday, is that they feature large dipoles. So you asked me the question yesterday. So said this way, this is totally wrong. If you put them in a Rydberg state, they have no dipole. But they feature dipole moment connecting states with uh, opposite parity. Okay? So the thing which is large is not the dipole, but this is the dipole matrix element connecting two nearby states. And the scaling is also n squared, and that's of course very reminiscent to this thing because if the size is n squared, the dipole is also n squared. Okay, because it's proportional to the size. Okay, so because of these properties, actually, I, uh, you find out that those Rydberg atoms are interesting because they have exaggerated properties with respect to ground state atoms. So first, they will feature very strong interactions, and second, they will uh, exhibit very strong coupling to fields. In particular, they are highly polarizable. And this is exactly what Jean-Michel used in his experiments. I will come back to that in a minute. So let's try to understand a bit more in detail those scaling laws. Okay? And uh, to do that, I uh, first need to, do to give you <coughs> a small description of what Rydberg atoms are and why they are so close to the hydrogen atom. So if you do experiments and you measure the position of the Rydberg state, you find a formula which is very familiar to you to one exception, the energy is minus the Rydberg constant, so minus 13.6 EV, divided by essentially the principal quantum number square. Everything is in the essentially. So why is it essentially? I mean, this is strictly true if you've got the hydrogen atom. In the hydrogen, you will find En, which is minus 13.6 EV, so essentially the Rydberg, divided by N squared. Okay? But an hydrogen atom is just a point nucleus with a minus charge. Here, if we take any alkali atom, let's say rubidium, the thing is a bit different because now what you have is actually an electronic cloud, the inner shell, with a charge plus Q at the center, actually 37Q, and then, so sorry, I mean it's a rubidium 37, so essentially you've got 37 plus Q, 36 electron, and an outer electron here. Okay, I think it's fine. So it's not a point like nucleus. So what this means actually is that for electrons with low angular momentum, you may remember from your uh, AMO physics class that actually the probability of the scaling of this wave function is R to the power L, where R is the distance to the nucleus. This means that for low-lying L states, you've got a non-zero probability that the electrons enter the inner shell. And therefore, it doesn't see a 37 plus Q charge screened by the 36, which makes it plus one charge. Okay? It sees a charge which is stronger from the nucleus because it's not screened by the outer electron. Therefore, for low-lying L states, 
the electron is more bound to the nucleus than for high lying L state, for which then you can completely say, well, I mean, this is plus 37 minus 36, this is plus 1, and I'm fine, I'm back to the hydrogen atom. But this is only true for high uh, angular momentum. Okay? So this is the reason why you slightly need to change the n in a phenomenological way to a n which is slightly smaller, so actually the energy is deeper bound. Okay, so this is what is called the quantum defect. It depends on L and uh, also on other quantum numbers, but it's not too important. So this is the quantum defect. So that's clear. This is why you need to introduce that. It's just because the atom is not a point-like nucleus uh, coupled to an electron. You do need to take into account the fact that the low-lying L state can penetrate the electron core and sees more plus charge from the nucleus. So there is a correction. So the correction is expressed in this term. And if you want to know how strong is this correction, so those are the quantum defects for, and it's experimental, and there is no way to calculate it ab initio. So you measure. For n larger than 30, they are essentially constant, and the values are non negligible for L equals 0, <coughs> 1, 2. And as soon as you reach 3, then it becomes negligible. So the largest correction, obviously, for S uh, equal of L equals zero, so S orbitals, because then they can really have a non-zero probability to be sitting right on the nucleus. And for the others, you also have some correction. But you see that the correction is actually non-negligible. It's three, so with respect to N equals 50, for example, I mean, uh, you, uh, it's the equivalent of an hydrogen atom for N equals 47. Okay, so there is a correction. All right. So now let's try to look at the scaling. So, I mean, it's an important fact because it means that essentially, apart from this small correction, I can understand all the properties of Rydberg atoms, at least for the alkyl, in terms of the properties of the hydrogen atom. So if you know the hydrogen, you're done. The only subtlety is that you need to change in the formula the n by this corrected n, which includes the quantum defect. Okay? So once again, I can think of Rydberg atom as essentially an hydrogen atom. So now let's try to do a bit the scaling. I mean, if you remember your wave function of the hydrogen, so the R, R and R, which is the radial wave function as a function of R, I mean, essentially, it will look like this. You've got n minus l minus 1 zeros here. And the average value of r, which you can calculate from the, from the wave function, is actually 3 half of a naught times n squared minus l l plus 1. That's the result of the, the calculation. OK, so for low-lying l state, so low-lying is important here because, I mean, Jean-Michel explained you circular rebirth state. So circular rebirth state. L is n minus 1. So this is certainly not the low-lying state. But here, we will focus mainly on the low-lying state. So <coughs> L much smaller than n. Essentially, you recover R, which is n squared, n naught. If you forget about the 3 half and all the things. Uh, do you want me to switch on the light, or you can read the blackboard? Okay. How can we recover very quickly and when I say n, of course, what should be understood, based on what I just told you in a minute, is that it should be the corrected principal quantum number. There is a model which is extremely fruitful to recover that. This is the Bohr model of the atom. Okay, so everyone tells you it's wrong. Well, I mean, sure, it's kind of wrong. But for circular rebirth state, it's exact almost. And for low-lying state, it allows you to recover the scaling. What is it about? You just assume a plus charge, a minus electron, and you write Newton's law. So you write that for the electron mv squared over r, so the centrifugal uh, force, is equal to the force between the electron of the nucleus. So this is q squared over 4 pi epsilon naught. And you write the condition of quantization introduced by Bohr, which is that the angular momentum is nh bar. And now you eliminate the velocity. And what you find immediately by doing that is that r is n naught, is n squared times n naught. OK, so this is a very fruitful model, because if you have forgotten completely this, and usually I do uh, forget this, uh, at least I can recover very quickly the scaling argument. 
Okay, so that's the first thing, is that the scaling is almost the one of the hydrogen. The size is almost the uh, n square n naught. And so now what about the dipole moment? Well, I mean, I have two wave functions. So if I want to calculate dn l, let's say, n minus 1, l minus 1, so two nearby state, what I need to look at is the overlap integral of two wave functions that essentially look the same. So slightly different because they don't have exactly the same zero. Okay, I detail them way too much, but at the end of the day, they are slightly separated. So the overlap is extremely good. So essentially, you've got the overlap of the function with n zeros, the one with n minus one zeros, because you've got so many zeros, it doesn't really matter whether you slightly shift one with respect to another. So now the overlap integral for the dipole matrix element, which would be something proportional to R N L times E R R minus one L minus one R square D R. So this is my matrix element, D N L minus one, is essentially going to be proportional to the size of this wave function on this is N square again. Okay, and once again, when I say that, I should always understand that this is the effective N square. Okay, so we kind of understood the scaling. <laughs> so just one thing, because it's very, very uh, striking, actually, when you run the numbers. Rydberg atoms are really, really huge. <coughs> this is kind of a miracle that we can do anything with them. So this is something I've taken for a PhD thesis from uh, Stuttgart. So this is the classical diameter, so essentially this formula, as a function of the principal quantum number, expressed uh, so in a micrometer compared to some kind of uh, a biological object. So n equal 20, you're already close to the size of a virus, okay? Then 60 bacteriophage. And then when you arrive around 100, you have size that becomes comparable to red blood cells. So this is really doing macroscopic physics, and you can see almost a red blood cell uh, by, uh, by not by height, but with a microscope with no problem. So really, the electron is uh, more than a micrometer away from the, the nucleus. So this is kind of a striking uh, feature. So basically, the, the you can view that as your circular Rydberg atoms, so your blood cells. So this is the nucleus, and this is the wave function around. Okay? Let's finish off the scaling. <coughs> so I will discuss a few of these scalings already, but let's finish that off. So we've already discussed the binding energy, essentially 1 over n squared. The level spacing, which will be useful in a minute, is 1 over n cubed. And because essentially you do n plus 1 minus e n, so that gives you essentially 1 over n plus 1 squared minus 1 over n squared. So this is 1 over n cubed. Okay? Size of the wave function we've discussed. The lifetime, I'm not going to show you really the scaling, it's not too important, but essentially the lifetime of this Rydberg, so scales like the cube of the principal quantum number, and you have to be a bit careful with Rydberg, there are two sources for the lifetime. If you just take a Rydberg NP, for example, it can decay back to the ground state. Let's say 5S in the case of rubidium. This is the gamma, which is proportional to one over N cubed. But now that's not the only thing that those Rydberg atoms can do. They can also, by black body radiation, actually jump into nearby state. Okay, and roughly speaking, the this is the same order of magnitude with a different <coughs> size. So it's not too important. Okay? Uh, the last thing I want to discuss, so there is the polarizability, which is telling you if you apply an electric field, uh, the polarizability, I remind you, you have a dipole which is induced by an electric field. External electric field so that gives rise to star shift. Or, and actually, in the case, river, this is quadratic. This thing here is actually uh, the polarizability that scales like n to the seven. So it's something which is extremely sensitive to uh, small perturbation, which is kind of the nightmare for the experimentalist because it means you need to be very careful about shielding electric fields and all this. And the last important thing is the C6 coefficient that we will use, so the van der Waals coefficient. And we will do the scaling based on the perturbation theory <laughs> that we, we've done yesterday. So if you remember correctly, the C6 coefficient essentially 
was a sum of terms of pair d1, d2 operator, and L prime n second L second modulus square divided by the energy nl minus n prime l prime n second l second. You remember this? That was the perturbation theory we've uh, developed yesterday. So now, if I just assume that essentially one, and this is a sum over all those things, huh? but let's assume that one of these denominator is smaller than the others, and usually this occurs for n prime and n second roughly speaking, equal to n minus 1. Of course, the L and the, the L prime also have to be L plus or minus 1, and the same for L second. So that is non-zero. But that allows us to have the scaling, because essentially we've got the fourth power of the dipole matrix element, and we've said that the dipole matrix element scales like n to the square. So this is something which goes like dn n minus 1 to the power 4, divided by the difference in energy between nearby states, but we know what is the spacing is given here. It's 1 over n, n cube. So this guy goes like n to the 8. This one goes like 1 over n to the cube. Therefore, the scaling is n to the 11. So this is an extremely violent scaling, eh, because it means that if you take two atoms in, the, in their ground state, n equals 5, and you bring them to the Rydberg state n equals 50, you increase the interaction energy by 11 orders of magnitude. Okay, so this is really, there are not that many laws apart from the exponential law, but in physics that scales so violently than this. Okay? And so you see that based on what we discussed yesterday, essentially, not knowing too much about the details of the Hermit physics, we can understand already a lot about the hydrogen atom, uh, the, the Rydberg atoms. Questions so far? <coughs> Yeah. Okay, so the, the scaling comes from the following thing. It again comes from a uh, Fermi golden rule. Yeah. So this is essentially, if you want to calculate the lifetime from this state n to the ground state, you will have to consider the dipole coupling these two things, so n5 square omega n5 to the cube. But essentially, the Rydberg state is so close to the ionization threshold that it doesn't really matter how much is n. So essentially, this is the ionization frequency. Now the dipole, and I have not derived that to you, but the dipole matrix element, not from nearby state, but from state to the lower lying state, dn5, <coughs> they scale like 1 to the 3 half. So this is when you got gamma, which goes like 1 over n cube. Uh, this scaling is also the nightmare of the experimentalist because it means <laughs> the higher you go in hand, the more laser power you need to do the excitation. So uh, the people who buy the check are very aware of uh, who buy the lasers and we pay are very well aware of the fact that this is an expensive <laughs> uh, thing to this one over N three half. <coughs> okay. Other questions? Oh, the scaling is very different from the circular scale. Yes. So when I explain gamma, you can. <coughs> which you can also completely recover from the Bohr model, I'm sure you'll see. <coughs> okay? Right, so back to history. So I introduced Fraunhofer, Rydberg. Uh, so essentially, Rydberg atoms were kind of used, but not too much for spectroscopy, and things changed dramatically around 75, after the invention of the first laser. People started to do spectroscopy <coughs> measurement, and actually kind of uh, very important names in the field started to appear. And... Uh, it led to the development that I'm not going to detail because you have a few lectures on this by uh, Jean-Michel, but it's essentially this very strong dipole <laughs> moment allows you to couple maximally to a single photon. And this is the whole lecture of Jean-Michel. So basically that was the birth of cavity quantum electrodynamics. Okay, that led to the fact that essentially one Rydberg atom can interact with exactly one photon. Once again, this is because you've got this huge dipole moment that couples very efficiently to light, but the light field with just one photon. So far, no interactions, but not that I'm aware of. Actually, the first we saw interactions with Rydberg is sitting in front uh, here. 
yes, <laughs> a few years ago. Uh, and it was in an atomic beam. So what they were trying to do is to use a very dense beam of cesium atoms and to do the Rydberg excitation. And what they saw is that the line was much broader than what you would expect from Doppler broadening, from uh, all kinds of the usual broadening you have in these circumstances. And they interpreted it as the influence of actually here the resonant dipole-dipole interactions. I'm not going to detail this, uh, but essentially they had a beam that was so dense that indeed they had to care about the interactions. So that's the first uh, time I saw that in the literature on Rydberg atoms, the interactions appeared. This experiment was done certainly at a high temperature. So basically the problem is that usually this is hard to see because the, th the, the thermal energy of the beam is higher than the interaction energy, although they could see that. So then people, when they had cold atoms, thought, well, I mean, maybe it's interesting to go in the cold because then the excitation energy will be, sorry, the, the thermal energy will become smaller than the interaction energy. And so the whole field of Rydberg atoms interacting with cold or laser-cooled atoms started in 98, so for you it's ancient history, I know about that, but for me not that much, unfortunately. So Rydberg atoms meet cold, and there are two very important names in this field, so Pierre Pillet from Laboratoire Aimé Coton and Tom Gallagher in the US, and the two of them really did the first experiment where they tried to create an excitation in a gas of atom and saw the transport of excitation driven by the resonant dipole-dipole interaction. So I'm not going to explain that to you, it's actually you should read the paper, it's interesting. But this is the first time that people had the idea, the excitation driven by the interaction, so basically the fact that one excitation can hope from one atom for, to another one, can hope faster than the atoms can move. So essentially, they coined this term frozen gas, uh, where basically uh, you can do as if the atoms were not moving and only look at the propagation of excitations in this system. Okay, so the interactions. So this is something I've taken from this review, which is already almost 10 years old. Uh, where basically it summarizes the interactions energy you can have between atoms or ions for different regimes, so with the orders of magnitude. This is the interatomic distance, and this is the energy in Hertz. The van der Waals energy in the ground state, this is what we've calculated yesterday, essentially this is subhertz. For those of you uh, in the room who play with dysprosium atoms or very magnetic atoms, the interaction that you get, the magnetic dipole-dipole interaction, scales like one of the R cube, and it is subhertz at a distance of a few micrometers. And that's the reason why you place them in optical lattices closer to each other. The Rydberg atoms, they can be either van der Waals or um, resonant dipole, and you see immediately the uh, elements of the magnitude I was pointing out. Okay. The thing which is kind of striking, and then you take two ions, at one micron, they have the same energy essentially as two Rydberg atoms. Okay, they interact as strongly despite the fact they are neutral. You have to be just a bit careful that in this approximation, most likely you cannot assume that it's only a dipole interaction. That's not, I mean, you have to take into account quadrupolar interaction and so on. Okay, and so very importantly, uh, the interaction, so at a few micrometer distance, the strength of the interaction is in the megahertz range. So that's the number you should remember. Two Rydberg atoms are typically 10 megahertz, uh, uh, sorry, 10 micrometer. So let me write it down because this is really the energy scale we are talking about. So V between two Rydberg atoms is on the order of 10 megahertz for an interparticle distance of about 10 micrometer around N equal 50. Okay, this is very approximate, but it already tells you that this interaction is huge, okay? And so it's also telling you one thing. Remember that the lifetime, the gamma of Rydberg was one over 100 microseconds. So it means that actually this is a sub megahertz, so typically 10 kilohertz line width. And so this is the reason why you can use this Rydberg interaction on a time scale where the dissipation, which is to say the decay to the ground state, is irrelevant. Okay, so this is again back to what I was saying yesterday, that this is a coherent interaction. You can completely neglect spontaneous emission, which you cannot do if you have atoms separated by a wavelength, because then the interaction strength becomes on the same order as the line width of the transition. But here, we are so much in the near field that you can completely neglect the spontaneous emission. So despite the fact that this is not a super long lifetime, Still, 
it leads to dynamics which is much smaller, much slower than actually the one given by this uh, interaction. Okay? Right, so that led to actually this idea that um, we can use something probably useful with that, and the new era uh, started in uh, 2000, 2001 with two sorry, landmark papers from uh, names that uh, I'm pretty sure you recognize, so Zoller and Lukin essentially, plus uh, other pretty prominent theorists and Fleischauer and all these people, and Yaksh, actually, and Zirak uh, are actually pretty important theorists in this field. And so basically the idea is the following. The idea is that just take uh, two atoms, uh, yes, each atom being considered as a two-level system, so ground state, Hilbert state. Now we're going to plot the energy spectrum of those two atoms as a function of the distance. Of course, as yesterday, we have three states possible, uh, four, but only three energies, so GG, all the atoms in the ground state, RG, RGR, and RR, okay? So now, in terms of the Van der Waals interaction, the Van der Waals interaction between two atoms in the ground state is completely negligible, so I don't care, it hardly varies with the distance. If I take one atom in the ground state and another in the Rydberg state, same thing, you would have the resonant dipole interaction, but at a large distance, it's totally negligible. So this is also flat. So the only one which is not flat is the doubly excited Rydberg uh, state, okay? With the Van der Waals scaling, so C6 over R6 for this particular case. So now the basic idea that uh, Lukin, Zoller, Fleischauer, Sirak, and all these people had is that, okay, now, Let's try to excite this system. So we take a laser, we tune it on resonance with the excitation of one atom. Because of this energy shift, you are unable to excite the second atom. Not always, provided the fact that the line width of the excitation is larger, is smaller, sorry, than the strength of the interaction, which is the interaction shift. So that gives kind of a distance, which is the blockade distance, under which the atoms have to be in order to be blockaded. And this distance is going essentially by the line width of the prime, which here is the radi frequency, and because uh, there are no other line widths, essentially, equal the interaction energy. Okay, why is it interesting? So this is a situation which is called the blockade. You cannot excite the two atoms at the same time. It's interesting because now, if you do not know which of the two atoms to excite, quantum mechanics tell you, well, you're going to excite a superposition of the two of them. So you see that immediately this blockade regime leads to the production of entanglement. And so then theories become completely crazy because entanglement means quantum computing. Sorry, at least it's possible to do that. So why, and so this is the first thing. So because you can have the blockade, it leads to entanglement. And if you've got entanglement, you tend to gates as well. So that was the initial motivation. So there were some experiments that immediately started to look at that because when the ideas came out, Essentially, apart from Philippe Grangier uh, in Orsay, no one had individual atoms that you can manipulate. So basically, it was just too far off with respect to what people could do at the time. So people started to look for the blockade, but not with individual atoms, but in a random ensemble. The bit the idea of Pillet and Gallagher that I described to you earlier. So I'm not going to, to detail that too much, but essentially there was some very important work done in the US at the University of Connecticut in Heidelberg, also in with Pierre Pillet, University of Michigan, and in Stuttgart that really led to the first realization that indeed, if you try to excite your system, the blockade prevents you from putting too many ex Rydberg excitation in the system. That's essentially what they were looking for. And then came the two first experiments where they, we tried, uh, so in uh, at the Institute of Optique and also in the group of Mark Safman to measure the blockade with just two individual atoms strapped into either, which is what we're going to discuss now. Since then, the field has totally exploded, obviously, and there are many, many applications that uh, you can do. So. Uh, this is a few examples of what the, the field is looking at. So entanglement and gates, I will describe that a bit. Many body physics and quantum simulation will be the topic of tomorrow. But it's not only that. You can also create huge nonlinearities between, uh, I mean, in optical medium, just using these gigantic Rydberg interactions. You can make two photons interact in a gas of atom where the interaction of the nonlinearity comes from the interactions between the Rydberg atoms. And this leads to actually single photon nonlinearities, which is the holy grail of, uh, of, um, of quantum optics, essentially, and which is not so easy to realize experimentally. So there is a lot of that. And also the field have evolved towards uh, studying some kind of exotic type of molecules based on a binding mechanism that was proposed by Fermi in the 30s and never observed until 2009 in the group of uh, Tillman-Thor, essentially. So basically, you've got what is called the strilobite molecules. I'm not going to detail too much. 
but this is kind of an interesting line of research to look at a new way to bind molecules, which is not the usual covalent or ionic bound that you find in the chemistry textbook. This is another way of doing it. Okay, so I'm probably three times slower than what I thought, so let's start <laughs> uh, thought number two. <laughs> so that's fine with everyone. Do you have any questions so far? So it doesn't really matter. Huh? So okay, let's go through a few uh, experimental uh, considerations. Sure. Okay, so it's a good, qu it's a very good question. So I'm going to answer it in details now, which will save me time later. No, 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 this is fine. This is a very good question. <coughs> so let's take again the spectrum that I was discussing, RG, GR, and uh, GG, RR. Okay, I can use these bases. Essentially, if I turn on the dipole, resonant dipole interaction between this, it's completely negligible because one atom is in a ground state. So you can ignore the interaction on the energy uh, shift. But still, I can always change the basis and say I'm going to work in the 1 over root 2 Rg plus Gr and 1 over root 2 Rg minus Gr. The interaction being so small, essentially, they stay degenerate. Okay? And now I have my Rr, which is shifted by the van der Waals energy with respect to what it should be. Okay? So you see the same diagram, it's just I've changed the basis. <coughs> Probably allowed to do that. So now let's ask ourselves. I turn on a laser. The laser will couple this and this in principle. Okay, but this is zero. Why is it zero? Because at the end of the day, you want to calculate the dipole element the dipole matrix element, so not the average dipole, the dipole matrix element of the collective dipole. So GG D1 plus D2, 1 over root 2 RG plus GR. And if you do the calculation, you find that this is square root of 2 times DGR, because you got twice the same. And if you do the same, but now with the minus, sorry, the minus sign is here, well, you just have zero. So at the end of the day, I can select the plus sign with some caveat that I will detail maybe tomorrow. So slightly more subtle because you need to take into account also phase factor coming from the position of the atom. Okay, <laughs> sure. Mm, uh, could you comment on the uh, consideration of more than two at least of S? Yes, I could. <laughs> Same thing. And now it comes to exactly what Anna, I can erase that, it's too late anyway. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. So this is the Dicker picture that Anna introduced yesterday. Let's take N atoms. Let's consider the case where all the atoms are in the ground state. One atom is in the excited state, or which is the Rydberg, and you've got n of those states. Two excitations. Then you've got more and more. So at the end of the day, you've got, if I'm not mistaken, C2n. So this is the combinatorial factor. While here you have n state, and so on and so forth. OK, so this is zero Rydberg excitation, one Rydberg excitation, which is exactly the case we've dealt with uh, with just two atoms, two Rydberg excitation, and so on. So this is called the Dicke ladder. And it was already introduced yesterday by Anna. It turns out, so what are those states? It's RG, GGG, plus GR, GGG, and so on and so forth. You can do the exact same trick as I, as I have done. You can identify a state, which is what is called the symmetric state. One over root N, E, G, which basically means you've got one atom which is excited among all the others being in the ground state. Sum from I equal 1 to N. This one, so I can change the basis, take my state plus, which is this state, and then of course I still have n other states with different superpositions with various signs. You can do the calculation and you can find that you will have a dipole which is n n by square root of n, while here they are all subradiant. Therefore, you never couple to any of them. 
Okay, so you see that at the end of the day, even though you have n atoms, you always can treat your system as two level atoms, but the two level atoms being two uh, collective states. And uh, what we can do is then also have a look at tracing two Richard excitations in the same? Uh, yes. So that, that would make this more interesting. Uh, right? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. And I will discuss that tomorrow. Due to the blockade, I can select yes. this. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, of course, now it becomes more complicated here because as soon as I turn on, put two interactions, some of this energy is going to be shifted uh, because of the Van der Waals interaction. But let's come back to that tomorrow. Okay? Other questions? All right. So if there are no other questions, let's start uh, part number two. So the part number two is uh, a bit of plumbing about how we trap atoms and things. So I don't know, I mean, many of you are kind of familiar with that. So I mean, it's uh, essentially targeted towards the theorist <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> okay, so the first thing I wanted to remind you <laughs> is, and you all know that since uh, the first week and probably much better than that, how do you trap atoms optically? Okay, and you trap atoms optically using the dipole force. And I really want to emphasize the fact that the dipole force, you can understand it in two ways, either a classical way. So if you can use a classical argument, do it. Okay, they are intuitive. <laughs> so avoid quantum at any, uh, <laughs> any expense <laughs> if you can. So the classical argument is the following one. You have an atom, which essentially is a polarizable medium. You act with an electric field, the one from the light, and you're going to induce a dipole. This dipole, if you are far from the resonance, essentially it reacts in a dispersive way to the field. So this alpha here has this kind of dispersive shape. It contains almost, if you are far from resonance, almost no, uh, no imaginary part, which would lead to the dissipation. So, of course, now, this dipole induced by the field is going to interact with the field. Strictly speaking, the interaction energy is minus one-half of alpha E squared. So, if you work below the resonance, alpha is positive. So you've created an energy which is proportional to the inverse of the intensity. So the energy is maximum, is minimum, sorry, where the intensity is the strongest. Okay? And uh, this is a conservative potential because you work very far from the resonance and you can completely ignore the spontaneous emission, which is the, uh, the dissipative part of the polarizability, on which is only uh, occurring close to resonance. Of course, there is the second approach, which is more quantum, where you just say, well, the light is going to induce a light shift if you are far from resonance, so if you just take two uh, level atoms, switch on a laser which is below the resonance, then the effect of this laser is to shift the energy by an amount which is essentially proportional to the Rabi frequency squared divided by the death unit. And by the way, it's exactly what you find if you do, you plug the classical alpha here. So the usual Lorentz model is extremely fruitful because it gives exactly the quantum result. Even if you don't know quantum, you can find easily this expression. Okay. So the only problem is that, of course, and you all know that, uh, it's very hard to have large trap depth because essentially those light shift, even with watts of laser power, depending on how much you focus, but it's typically uh, on order the order of magnitude of 10 micro K to one milli Kelvin. So that's usually a trap depth you can create by or the, the light shift you can create. So it requires called atom mobility. You've got different ways to use those uh, light shifts. So there is the one that many of you know, so you can, uh, uh, prepare optical lattices. So the optical lattices, the basic idea is that you interfere two waves. It creates a standing wave pattern. It can be made in 1D, in 2D, in which case you've got tubes, or in 3D, in which case you've got this kind of crystalline uh, structure, which is not necessarily cubic, depending on how you arrange the geometry of the lasers. And the thing which uh, is important to us is the fact that we want to do many bodies still being able to uh, address individually the atoms. So about 10 years ago came this idea of what is called a quantum gas microscope now, which is very well spread. So essentially, you combine this optical lattice with a high numerical aperture lens in order to be able, able to observe with a high resolution the atoms trapped in an optical lattice. So this is uh, uh, one figure of this uh, paper from the group of Emmanuel Bloch, uh, so or maybe, I uh, don't remember, sorry. no, so, uh, Marcus Greiner, uh, earlier. Okay? So that's the first thing. You can have individual atoms if you combine optical lattices with high NL lenses. Uh, how do you load these things? I mean, at the end of the day, you would like to have exactly one atom uh, in each of the sites. Uh, so what you do is you uh, rely on what is called this superfluid to insulator uh, uh, transition, so the mode transition, where essentially you can create an array where you've got one atom in each trap. 
knowing the fact that this is the ground state of the system. If you put two atoms in one quad, then they interact by the S-wave interaction described by uh, Yuk, and this costs some energy. So this is not the ground state, this is the ground state. So now how do you prepare that? You start from the ground state of your uh, system, which is the Bose-Einstein condensate that you, you have to prepare, obviously. You switch on adiabatically the array, and you can follow the ground state of the system. I will give you more details on that uh, tomorrow. And at the end of the day, you end up in the ground state of the atoms in the lattice, which is this configuration, knowing that this one would correspond to an excitation. I mean, it looks easy. It's actually hard to do in the lab and also uh, hard not to get any excitation in this system. But at the end of the day, you've got an ordered array of atoms with one atom per side, okay? And you've got the resolution. The second way to do that, which is becoming more popular those days, is to use optical tweezers. So optical tweezers, they are just a single laser beam, and this single laser beam you focus very tightly. So typically as close as you can from the wavelength. And if you do that, you will be able to trap in 3D. Why is that so? Because, I mean, if the waste you are focusing on is on the order of the wavelength, along this direction of propagation, the Rayleigh distance, which is essentially the waste square divided by lambda, also becomes on the order of lambda. So this is only because you focus very tightly that this tweezer becomes traps in 3D. Otherwise, the traps would be extremely elongated. Okay? Right, so in order to do that, of course, you need to have a high NL lens uh, in order to prepare the waste, which is as close as possible from lambda. And typically, the trapping volume is on the order of the cube of the wavelength that you're operating at. Okay? So it's kind of nice as well from the point of view of the laser power requirement because <laughs> now it's so tightly focused that even only a milliwatt of laser power focused on one micrometer allows you to prepare trap depth <coughs> in the millikelvin region. Okay. So how is it done in practice? Uh, you uh, use, so this is kind of a sketch of a typical experiment we have in the group. You can discuss to Kai actually who is building one in our group. So you have Large NL lenses, they can be inside <coughs> vacuum, outside, they are all kind of configuration, it doesn't really matter. You focus the light coming from a laser, which is supposed to be the dipole trap laser. You focus the light on a spot size of one micrometer. It acts as a trap at the focal point, and you load this thing from a cloud of laser cooled atoms. So you do not need to have any DC in these things, it's just a regular <coughs> magneto optical trap or even an optical molasses. Now, you are able, while you have your optical molasses on or your laser cooling uh, on, the laser cooling induces on the cooling transition some photons, fluorescent photons, that you can collect on a fluorescent on a CCD camera. And for example, you can look at what happens on one pixel of the CCD camera, which is supposed to image what's going on in uh, the plane where the atoms are supposed to be located. And the kind of signal that you observe is essentially this one. So as a function of the time, on the photon uh, counter, which is your camera, you see some kind of steps. So you observe a <coughs> uh, blinking square here, which is not telling you that the atom is square, right? It's the <coughs> pixel of the camera. And you've got, at the same time, the level of fluorescence that you observe, and they go uh, up and down. And typically, in 10 milliseconds, you're able to detect about 100 photons, which is enough to decide with very high uh, fidelity that the atom is present or not. So how can we interpret this curve? Initially, there is nothing, so that's the low level. At some point, one atom, by chance, enters in this trap. Because you've got the cooling laser on, the atoms is going to be slowed down in the trap and is going to stay in the dipole trap. Okay? You need the friction force, otherwise the atom enters and leaves. So if the friction force is ensured by the cooling laser that are always on during this phase. Okay, fine, so the atom is here, it stays there. And so now what happens? At some point, the signal drops. And it drops because a second atom had tried to enter in the, in, the, in the trap. And then very rapidly, the two atoms undergo a collision, which I'm going to explain in a minute, that expels the two atoms at the same time. So for any practical point of view, you've got either no atoms, so it's not interesting, one atom for a short period of time, for, for a time which is this one, and then two atoms for a very short period of time before the two of them leave the trapping region. What is the mechanism of this collision? It's actually nice because it uses the dipole interaction I've explained to you yesterday. So let's <coughs> consider the potential curve that we have derived from our toy many body uh, model of two two-level atoms. Yes? How do you know that you're not hitting out? That I'm not hitting what? 
or it's so deep that actually, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the fluorescence cools the atom at the same time. Ah, okay. So you can keep the atoms for minutes and this. Yeah. So. Okay, so let's again plot the potential energy of two atoms at a distance r for different states. So let's say that my, my uh, rubidium atom, yeah, there is no rubidium here, my rubidium atom is going to be an S state and a P state. So that's correspond to 5P, 5S. I can have the two atoms in the S state, in which case they interact. So who is the Nobel Prize, uh, the Nobel laureate? Because it's 46, so then it should have been announced. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you can have the two atoms <laughs> in the state. <laughs> yes, yeah? Okay, so we still have four minutes to go, so pay attention for an extra two minutes before <laughs> you. <laughs> so you can have either the two atoms in the A state, in which case they interact at the Van der Waals interaction, which is essentially flat at a large distance. And now you've got those potential curves that corresponds to the resonant dipole dipole interaction, plus and minus. C3 over R3. So now if you have a pair of atoms, and, and so what is that? This is just a transition uh, for the rubidium. It's at 780 nanometer. So now if you have two atoms that arrive in their ground state, at some point they will be laser excited to this potential curve. <coughs> and you will essentially couple to the plus sign, uh, coming back to your question, which it turns out is this one. The atoms are going to be accelerated through this long range potential. Now it's much longer range than for the van der Waals. And at some point, of course, it's an instable molecule. It decays back to the ground state. But in the time before it decays, it has gained a kinetic energy, which you can calculate, and which is typically larger than 100 millikelvin. And therefore, it can escape the trap, which has only one millikelvin of trap depth. OK? So this is, again, an illustration of this dipole-dipole interaction. You have the resonant dipole-dipole interaction and the van der Waals. <coughs> OK, so this is very neat, apart from the fact that it's a non-deterministic source. So because it's non-deterministic, <coughs> uh, I mean, I don't know when the atom uh, enters in the trap. OK, so now, uh, which atoms have been uh, used uh, so far? Well, I mean, this is the, the atoms that have been used for laser cooling. But uh, in red, those are the ones that have been single trapped. Uh, in the recent years. So actually, uh, rubidium and cesium are the oldest one. Now there is lithium and sodium. I forgot lithium. And you've got more <laughs> atoms that are coming along. So erbium, iterbium, strontium, and chromium. OK. So you've got one atom. But you don't want to have one atom. You want to have many atoms. So how do you do that? Well, you use diffraction. So on the laser beam that you use in order to create the arrays of trap, you're going to put a spatial light modulator, which imprints a phase. So that's an example of a phase pattern you put here. So essentially, the phase of the electric field of the light is e to the i phi x y right after the modulator. It's a liquid crystal modulator. And here, Fourier optics tells us that we're going to have the Fourier transform of this phase factor in the focal plane. So it looks like an easy problem. We'll just take the Fourier transform inverse, and you know the phase for a given geometry. It's actually very hard to do, because if you take the Fourier inverse of the intensity, you have an electric field which should have both an amplitude and a phase. And you can only encode the phase. Doesn't matter. People have designed, and that was a very long time ago, some algorithm in order to do that. So you can, for a given geometry, calculate the phase you wish by an iterative algorithm. OK, so in the particular case of the phase, which is here, this is a Kagome lattice. Yeah, so you've got this kind of uh, hexagon with triangle uh, in that you can see. <coughs> So the only problem, of course, is that uh, uh, the loading of the thing is random. So this is a movie of a 10 by 10 array, which is loaded continuously. So what you see is that atoms enter and leave. So each of the dots corresponds to one atom that comes in. So it's a fluorescence image here. So you almost never have all the traps still at the same time. So the idea to, uh, <coughs> to bypass this, what was actually a very big problem of this platform uh, for almost 18 years, is uh, to uh, start from this and to move the atoms around. And the amazing thing is that it can be done, and it can be done with a high fidelity. So now what we're going to do, we're going to add an extra laser beam. So there is the steady pattern created by the spatial light modulator. Nothing moves. I mean, it's a steady pattern, fixed. And I'm going to come with an extra laser beam here and move this atom from here to here, for example. OK? So this is illustrated by this small movie. So in dotted line, this is the spatial light modulator potential. 
So an atom is trapped here. You arrive with your tweezer, you crank up the intensity, and you grab the atom away and gently put it back to another position. It takes about one millisecond to move one atom from uh, on a distance which is typically 10 micrometer. So the thing which is kind of amazing, and I would not have bet a month's salary on this, is that it works very, very, very well. And so because it works so well with one atom, you can multiply that on large arrays and hopefully create order structure. So now, the idea is the following. <coughs> to start from a random structure, which is what it is, and to sort the atoms in this structure, one by one. So you start from this random pattern, and then you order them in two lines. Or you can uh, order them in this uh, 1D chain with periodic boundary conditions. Okay, so the dream of the theory, you know, they always sell the boundary condition. You can never do it in an experiment. This is a 1D chain with periodic boundary condition. <coughs> Square array, hexagon, and so on and so forth. So the thing which is kind of interesting is that in views of many body physics, this hexagonal pattern or this uh, Kagome type of array is exactly the one <coughs> that you have in graphene. But uh, for the Kagome, this is the one you've got for the, uh, if I remember correctly, the, the, the copper uh, <coughs> uh, ions in these uh, complicated compounds, which uh, exhibit some interesting magnetic properties. So, I mean, you see that you can realize some kind of artificial pattern uh, that could be useful to simulate uh, many body physics. Okay. I should point out that actually, of course, there is another, I mean, now there are many groups that do that. I mean, the other experiment that did it at the same time was the group of uh, Misha Lukin in Harvard. They did it slightly differently. They did it in one dimension. And essentially, you start from a chain of uh, tweezers. <coughs> you look where the atoms are. You switch off the tweezers that are empty. And then you move the tweezers. I remind you, in our case, we do not move the tweezer. This is a steady pattern. And you add an extra tweezer to move the atoms in this steady pattern. OK, so we can do it in 3D. I'm not going to explain you how you do it. So this is uh, average images, so not individual. I mean, those are individual atoms, but average. Because if you do not average the fluorescence, uh, half of these sites would be empty. OK, so that's important. So you can have this uh, interesting uh, pattern. Some are kind of useful to study topology. So you can create Mobius strips, for example. This way, uh, cones. Uh, the Eiffel Tower is useless, but uh, kind to put on a <laughs> website. And you can also do the sorting in three dimensions, so plane by plane, so it's a bit involved, but it can be done. And this is the <coughs> example of the elementary cell of what is called a pyrochlor lattice, which people look very much in uh, on spin models. So this is a pattern which is which has kind of uh, many open questions. Okay. Yep. At the moment, we've sorted up to seventy-two. Okay. okay. And uh, some people, I mean, I think the group of uh, the group in Darmstadt has done one hundred and twenty-one or something. So. And the largest number, so then you should discuss to Kai, because Kai is trying to increase this number. We sh think it could be reasonably easily, uh, be easily as to be put in quotation mark, but up to 1,000. <coughs> Which is already a lot, so. Okay, a bit more plumbing. So, <coughs> so who is the Nobel uh, laureate then? Uh, topology and exoplanet. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> So that's the reason why there is not more excitation than that in the <laughs> room. <laughs> All right. <coughs> um, so a bit more plumbing, very briefly. You need, of course, to excite the atoms to the Rydberg state. So um, you can do it either with a single <laughs> photon transition or you can do it with two photon transition. Okay, so two photon transition implies that uh, you, uh, you take your laser, which is detuned with respect to an intermediate state so that it's still a coherent manipulation. And if you do all this, uh, let's take this example of an array of a few atoms, you shine the light on this. And you can, on one of the atoms, for example, perform a Rabi oscillation between this state and this state. Okay? It ne it's important to see that the light has to be detuned, otherwise you would have spontaneous emission from the intermediate state. I mean, we could discuss a bit more about this, but I'm going to do it. Okay, so... Um, Kind of importantly, the time scale for performing the excitation is faster than the interaction energy, typically. And so it can be faster. So it's in the megahertz range as well. So everything on Rydberg physics occurs on time scale that are very different from, uh, for example, people that do quantum gas microscope, which is usually on the kilohertz range because you are dominated by the tunneling between sites uh, or the interaction energy, which can be even uh, smaller. There is another kind of manipulation you can do with Rydberg atoms is the fact that you have two states to Rydberg state close by, coupled by a transition in the microwave region, so typically gigahertz. 
So you can also prepare an atom in these states and perform a Rabi oscillation on this transition. So this is an example <coughs> of a Rabi oscillation driven by a microwave from this state to this state. Okay, so you've got two ways to either use lasers or microwave in order to manipulate these Rydberg atoms. Okay, so in the last 15 minutes, I will try to describe you how we measured the interactions uh, between Rydberg atoms, and that would be the good entry point uh, towards blockade physics and the many-body uh, physics tomorrow. So if you want to know a bit, there are a few references uh, that will be on the slide that I will give to um, Mathilde, and that they will be posted, I don't know where, but somewhere. On the website. <laughs> on the website, okay. <laughs> All right, so just to summarize again, uh, you can have essentially two types of interactions between the Rydberg atoms. The most natural one is the van der Waals interaction. That's the one that you encounter if you place two atoms in the same Rydberg state. That's what we've learned yesterday. In this case, this state is essentially shifted by an amount, which is C6 over R6. The second type of interaction is the resonant dipole-dipole interaction. So now you don't place the two atoms in the same Rydberg state, but you place the two of them in two states with different parities. So you've got this degeneracy, NS, NP, NP, NS. And then they will be coupled by the resonant dipole-dipole interaction. So let's try first to do the measurement of the, uh, the van der Waals interaction. Okay, so let's take uh, two atoms. Once again, the same figure uh, as the one I showed you before. Each of them will be considered by a two level, as a two-level system, driven by a Rabi frequency, so laser, which is able to drive a Rabi oscillation between those two states. Okay, and you shine the light on those two things. As I told you, you can, uh, this is the energy spectrum that we've already <coughs> discussed, so you can be either in the blockade region, in which case you do not excite the two of them, but very importantly, if you are in this regime, you can completely forget about the excited state. So at the end of the day, this is exactly the equivalent of a two-level system and this is exactly uh, the question I answered to at some point. You can view them as GG, a collative state, two atoms in the ground state, or this entangled state, RG plus GR. And the coupling strength in this regime is enhanced by a factor square root of two, which is the drawing I did here, just because the dipole of this collection of two <coughs> atoms is enhanced by square root of two. Okay? And uh, this is, if you had n atom, you would have the omega square root of n. So let's try to do that with two atoms. Let's start first with the two atoms very far from each other. And I try to drive them with the laser. If I do that, I observe Rabi oscillations. <coughs> what I plot here is the probability to excite the two atoms at the same time in the Rydberg state. So you see that this oscillates. Of course, it's not perfect because it's a real experiment, but let's forget about the fact it's not perfect. Let's look at the shape of this curve. Does it look like a sign to you? So what should it be, actually? No, it's not a sine square. It's even more than a sine square. Hmm? Forget about the decay. <laughs> well, I mean, if the atoms are very far, essentially, you can excite them independently. So the probability to have the two atoms in the Rydberg state is the product to have excited the first and the second one. So this is PR A, PR B. But the probability to excite as a function of time one atom, which is to drive a Rabi uh, oscillation, is sine square of omega t over two. You've done it twice, so it's a fourth. Okay, so this is the square of the uh, Rabi oscillation. And indeed, this is what uh, you see here. So that's the reason why it has this kind of funny shape. You can do the very same experiment, trying to measure the probability to excite the two atoms at the same time when the atoms are very close to each other. So in this case, the Rabi frequency is much smaller than the van der Waals interaction, and indeed you observe that you have hardly any excitation of your two-atom system. Okay? So this is what is called the blockade regime. But the thing which is interesting, I mean, when you are in situation, this is kind of panicking because of you see, uh, seeing zero on an experiment, you know, no excitation is not too difficult. Uh, you just uh, don't send the laser or have it unlocked or whatever. So you want to check that indeed something is happening on the experiment. So you're going to look at another quantity, which is the probability <coughs> to excite one of the two atoms and only one. If you are in the uh, non-blockaded regime, what you'll have now is a function which should not be this one, but this is p1 minus p. 
okay, where P is the Rydberg probability. It's independent, the probability to excite the first one and to not excite the second one. So, I mean, of course, in real life, because we've got the decay and all this, it kind of looks like this, but not exactly. It doesn't matter. It's kind of the thing. But the thing which is kind of important is to observe that now if we are in the blockade regime, we do observe an oscillation. So indeed, when we had zero here, it doesn't mean that nothing had happened. It meant that we had not excited two atoms at the same time, but we did excite one and only one atom. The thing which is striking is the fact that if you look at the time it takes to do a pi pulse, it's actually square root of two smaller, actually not square root of two exponentially, it's 1.41. It's a pretty good approximation from square root of two. And this is again the square root of two enhancement that I was discussing. So this is the signature of the fact that you are doing a collective excitation of this dipole. Okay? So as a matter of fact, you start initially from the two atoms in the ground state, and when you arrive here after a pi pulse, you've prepared this entangled state. I will put a lot of uh, quotation marks on entangled state later to counteract the trend which is to decide that everything is entangled in life. That's not true. So you have to be a bit more careful. So, no, sure. But you, but you, could, you could you could make up for this energy shift uh, in the spectrum when you uh, think this latest excitation, like the sequence of the excitation. No? Sure. Yeah, I can do a two photon excitation. Yeah, yeah. That I could, yeah. But it's a lower order process, so usually we don't do that. We've done it to do some spectroscopy, but uh, yeah. Okay, now let's work actually in the more, I mean, not more, but the other interesting regime. I mean, so far I worked in a regime where essentially I could completely ignore that. So the energy, the exact energy, the interaction energy between the atoms completely dropped out of the problem. So I, this is a very nice thing because it means that even if the distance is slightly fluctuating, as long as it stays larger than the language of the excitation, you, you still have the blockade. So this is very fulfilling, this thing. Now let's work in a regime where I have a line width which is on the order of the transition of the interaction energy. So in this case, I, the dynamics of the system is going to be driven not only by omega, as it was before, the radio frequency, but omega and the interaction energy. So let's do that. So we work, so these are all the curves I showed you before. And so now this is the regime where I'm in the case where Rb, of the delta particle distance, is equivalent to the Rydberg blockade. So you see that actually <laughs> it looks a bit, I mean, something is happening halfway between this and this, okay? Either on the single atom excitation or the two atom excitation. But the thing which is interesting is that just do a very small model with the Schrodinger equation. So all dynamics, so it's a three atom state model. So you take those three states, you introduce your U, and you solve Schrodinger. So there is no dissipation in the problem, no nothing. It gives you this. It's very close to that. So you see that now, if you know what is your omega, you can fit from the data the u. And so you can do that for various distances and therefore extract the u, which is the interaction energy between the two atoms. So when you do that, so this is the results of this fitting for different principal quantum number. This is the U of um, the van der Waals energy that you extract as a function of the distance. So you repeat the experiment for various distances, and you do see that there is uh, those huge trends as a function of distance. So this is in log-log scale to emphasize the 1 over R6. I do emphasize this wild scaling that we discussed uh, earlier in the lecture, which is for a given distance, if I change the principal quantum number only from 53 to 62, it doesn't look like a, a huge change. And still, you change the strength of the interaction by a factor 50. So this is reminiscent of this uh, n to the power 11 that we discussed earlier. So in a sense, kind of neat, because this is doing with just two atoms, what Cavendish did with two mass uh, more than 200 years ago. Uh, so of course, I mean, it's not a discovery. Everyone knew that two atoms had to interact by the van der Waals interaction. And the thing which is kind of uh, new is to be able to measure it with just two atoms. I mean, any chemist knows how to extract from his uh, thermal capacity or whatever, the, or the molecular uh, binding energy, the C6 coefficient. So there is <coughs> nothing uh, particularly fundamental here, apart from the fact that if you put the ab initio calculation, you DC, so which is the based on the calculator I showed you yesterday, you do see that there is a good agreement. So it shows that indeed those platforms have the control necessary to be able to do uh, this measurement. So this is a, a calculation with no ad adjustable parameter. This is just uh, nothing. You just measure the distance between the atoms and you can have. Okay, questions so far? <coughs>
Yes. Sure. But yeah, yeah. Okay. So, for example, if you look at the uh, data I showed you here, indeed you see some decay. This decay comes essentially from the spontaneous emission from the intermediate state, not from the Rydberg itself. The decay from the Rydberg on the time scale we are operating at is totally negligible. It takes about 100, uh, at most one microsecond to perform this experiment. So this is in unit of the pulse area, but in time it would be zero to one microsecond. So on this lifetime, the probability that the Rydberg decays is 1%. <coughs> so it's negligible. But during the excitation by the laser, because it's a two photon condition, you got some other type of imperfection that pops in. And that's, just the, that's the whole point of all the field at the moment, is trying to I mean, fight against those imperfections. But the Rydberg lifetime, on this time scale, you can really ignore them. We've got many other more mundane problems before the Rydberg lifetime. What no, no, here the, the lower state is the ground state. We perform this Rabi oscillation between the ground state of the Rydberg atom. Sorry. Uh, this way. Oops, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. And this is what I showed you earlier on this. So this is really the ground state of the atom going to the Rydberg state. So this is a Rabi oscillation on this transition <coughs> when I include the fact that this atom moves. So there is only one Rydberg state involved here. Okay? And the idea is actually now to move to what happens if I have another Rydberg state, which is to go to the resonant interaction case. So now we're going to do exactly what you have in mind, which is let's now consider another Rydberg state nearby. So, so far we are operating on this transition, and now we're going to operate on this transition. So we assume first that we can excite the atoms to this state. We're going to ignore now the low-lying state and only operate on two Rydberg states with opposite parity. So what happens from the point of view of the interactions? I mean, you start to understand that. I mean, Anna has derived the thing. We've discussed that yesterday. You've got this exchange interaction. If I put one atom in the A state, the other one in the P state, then I can have this flip-flop interaction. So it really implements this operator that we've written several <laughs> times between Anna and I, VDD, but here we are in the near field regime and therefore you only have the contribution to the one over R cube term. D here is the matrix element connecting the S and the P. Uh, this is not something you do not need the light or the microwave to induce it. It's here because this is a matrix element. And can we measure that on the experiment? Well, let's try to go in the lab. Just take two atoms at a given distance. So here the distance is 30 micrometer. And let's prepare one atom in the state P, the other one in S, and measure after some time their state, and it oscillates, and it oscillates in phase opposition, which is exactly this coherent transfer of an excitation from one atom to another one, driven by the resonant dipole interaction. Okay? So this is clear to everyone, this? I mean, for those of you who don't really know why it's doing that, this is actually a problem that I'm sure all of you have done in uh, your quantum physics class at least once. You have two eigenstates. An eigenstate plus and eigenstate minus. They are separated in energy by plus V and minus V. You initially prepare your state EG, which is not an eigenstate of the problem, but you can decompose it over an eigenstate, over two eigenstates. Sorry. <coughs> That's the initial state. So now when the time changes or evolves, those two components are going to dephase with each other because they have different energy. So you will have 1 over root 2 e minus vt over h bar plus plus e to the i vt over h bar minus. Okay? So this is psi of t. So now if you want to measure the probability of having after a given time the two atom in Pg, you just take this state, Eg, that you project, and you take the modulo square. And what you find when you do the calculation, starting from there, is that this is one half of e to the minus omega vt over h bar plus e vt over h bar modulus square. And this is exactly your cosine square vt over h bar. Therefore, you do have 
exactly this uh, elementary textbook problem here. Okay? And so the frequency should be given directly by the interaction energy. So you can vary the distance between the atoms as a function uh, and measure the frequency of the oscillation. So this is an example. The data, obviously, are the, the, the exponent. The error bars are smaller than the size of the dots. So this is in log-log scale. So you see the one over R cube. And you also see that it varies quite a lot. And you also see something which I always find totally mind-boggling is that the fact that the atoms, we still are able to measure the oscillation, even though the atoms are separated by almost 100 micrometer. Now, around you, the thickness of a sheet of paper is 100 micro. <laughs> so it's as if you were having two atoms on two sides of your sheet of paper, and they could talk to each other if you remove the sheet, obviously. Okay. So this is really a macroscopic distance when you can still measure this. Of course, it's a dipole interaction, and therefore, for a dipole interaction, there should, have, uh, there should be an angular dependence. Okay? This angular dependence is the angular dependence of the dipole transition with respect to the quantization axis. So you can measure the variation of this frequency as, with respect to a quantization axis set by the magnetic field, you change the angle of the interparticle uh, axis. And you measure in polar coordinate this, and you find this nice dipolar pattern, which is the one you learn from ENM, which is this 1 minus 3 cosine square theta that we actually um, put in the, I mean, discussed yesterday in the VDD. Okay? All right. So it's good because I will stop here. So this is the graph I showed you at the beginning of the talk. So this was a theory graph in 2010 in this review paper. So this is now the experimental graph, okay, where you put also the interaction energy as a function of the distance in log log scale for the van der Waals interaction in green so there are just a few set of data and the resonant dipole dipole interaction and there is the one uh, controlled by an electric field which i have not discussed and i will not but uh, okay so essentially this is uh, this curve that you are plotting here okay so i will stop here and tomorrow we'll do the quantum information part and some uh, simulation at least as far as i can go Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, you have a two to your calculator right there. So yes. can you set this limit here in any way? Yes. And how? Or <laughs> um, okay, so the problem is uh, you, you've got several kind of problems that we are trying to, I mean, all the community is trying to fight in a way or another. The first is that when you do a two-photon transition, of course, you need to uh, be detuned with respect to the intermediate state. If you are not enough detuned, you will have spontaneous emission. The problem is that you also, uh, in order to overcome the fact that you're detuned, you need more power here. And that's where the scaling I was mentioning at some point is killing you, because this as a Rabi frequency, which scales like the dipole, which scales like the inverse of n to the 3 half. So the higher in n, the worse this coupling is. So this is very bad. So usually this transition is in the blue, and it's hard to get a lot of laser light in the blue. So what people are trying to do those days is to work on a blue transition here for rubidium, for example, on an infrared transition where you've got much more laser light. In this way, you can detune more, and you can hopefully decrease the spontaneous emission. That's the first thing. But there is another technical challenge which is you also need to have two lasers that are phase locked with each other. Okay? Because any phase noise that you have means that you are driving your system with e to the i fluctuating phase. Okay? The problem is that it's also, and we only realized that like two or three years ago in the community based on work we've done in our group, which is that this fluctuating phase should be, or the, the fluctuation of this phase should be extremely small at the Rabi frequency. And it's the Rabi frequency is a few megahertz, so it means that you need to have a spectral density of noise of the laser, which is very low at a megahertz. And this is very hard to do. No one does that. In metrology, for example, they know how to do that perfectly well, but at a kilohertz, which is a completely different problem. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that we are trying to do. So, I mean, the one solution is to start from a laser source which has intrinsically less noise, and TISA for one example. But Uh, in which regime, sorry? Elaborate on the state preparation of the laser experiment before this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I make things, I mean, uh, yes, you put the atoms in state ASP, that's very easy. No, it's hard, actually, to do. 
we, we've done several things. So I'm not even sure I will give you the exact way we did it for this experiment because it changed several times. But the basic idea is the following. So you've got your uh, state P, your state S, and you start initially from the atoms that have been optically pumped in this stage. Right? You can do the following. And for this experiment that I showed you, I think it was done this way. You can, for example, take one of the two atoms, leave it in its trap, in which case this transition is shifted. So now you will excite this atom, but you will not excite this one. So you excite this one, then you use a <laughs> microwave and you put the atoms to this state. Okay? Now you switch off this guy, you turn on this laser, and you put the second one in state S, while the other one remains in state P because it doesn't see the laser. So that's one example for this preparation. So that's where the addressability in those systems is very important. No, they, when they are in the Rydberg, uh, until recently, <laughs> they were not trapped. And uh, they were not trapped. So, but okay, but that's kind of fine because the atoms are reasonably cold. So the atoms have a temperature which is typically 10 microkelvin. All the manipulation we do are done on a microsecond time scale. On a microsecond, essentially, the configuration, the spatial configuration is frozen. So the Rydbergs are not trapped. Actually, it's even worse. They would be anti-trapped by the tweezer light. <laughs> right? Because then you would induce a blue shift on this transition that kicks them away, which is something we actually use in order to improve the performance of the detection itself. But, uh, other questions? Or no I say it's the fly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs>